morning and welcome to the City Planning Commission public hearing. Madam Secretary. Good morning. Please this begin. is the City Planning Commission public meeting held at Spectre Hall, 22 Reed Street. Today is Wednesday, January 20th, 2016. As a courtesy during the proceedings, we ask that you please turn off all cell phones and beepers. All speakers should fill out a speaker's card at the desk outside of Spectre Hall. In addition, we ask that those providing testimony Please identify yourself, limit your remarks to three minutes, and speak clearly into the microphone. I will now call the roll. Chairman Weisbrod. Here. Vice Chairman Knuckles. Commissioner Besser. Commissioner Cantor. Here. Commissioner Cerullo. Commissioner Dela Here. Commissioner Dweck. Here. Commissioner Edie. Here. Commissioner Efron. Here. Commissioner Knight. Commissioner Levin. Here. Commissioner Marin. Here. Commissioner Ortiz. Here. A quorum is present. The first item is the approval of the minutes of the regular meeting of Wednesday, January 6, 2016. Um, on the minutes, uh, may uh, I have a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Second. Any uh, comments, questions? Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Minutes are approved. The next part of the calendar is the public hearing section, page one. Borough of Brooklyn, calendar number one, CD 16, C150171 PQK, a public hearing in the matter of an application for the acquisition of property concerning Friends of Crong Heights 26 Child Care Center. First speaker is Dale Lazarson from DCAS. Welcome back. Good morning. Hi. Uh, short and sweet. So, um, as you might have heard yesterday, mm -hmm. sorry, I am Dale Lazarson with DCAS, the Department of Citywide Administrative Services, Asset Management in the Leasing Department. And uh, this is an application, um, uh, a joint application between DCAS and ACS for the acquisition under a lease um, of the building located at 20 Sutter in Brownsville, Brooklyn, as illustrated uh, by these boards. ACS has been an occupant at this particular property since the 1970s. The current lease um, expired in 2014. ACS continues to occupy the property, and uh, resecuring Euler uh, will allow ACS to um, uh, a more stable presence in, in, its, uh, in its current occupancy. The building is a two-story building um, with a cellar, first floor, and a roof area. ACS occupies and will uh, with your approval, at least the entire building. Um, the proposed transaction on the table is a five-year lease term. Um, this is, as you have previously heard, um, a direction from ACS uh, based on its prior administration. When DCAS um, and other stakeholders receive the ACS needs assessment, to the extent that that particular needs assessment identifies, that ACS uh, would like to continue for a longer term, uh, remain at this site and occupy it, then DCAS with ACS will have dialogue about securing the property on a longer term basis. But for now, it is for uh, a five-year term, to the a proposed five-year term uh, with the owner, a long-standing owner, very good owner. The facility is in very good condition. And I do want to make uh, one mention. Um, when the application was filed in 2014, 2015, the um, proposed lease would be under an as-is basis, not much work to be done. The facility has been very well kept over the years by both the owner and ACS. However, um, given that the ULERT process has taken quite a while, the pa with the passage of time, had a lease been executed, under an executed lease, there would be ordinary repairs and maintenance needed. Uh, and either party who would have been responsible for those under the lease would have taken action. But with the passage of time pending that lease to be executed, we returned to the landlord uh, with ACS, and the landlord was agreeable to actually perform some of those things as a condition to this renewal. So a scope of work has been developed. It is a scope of work that, is, uh, that correlates to a shorter term lease, five years. 
back to what I said before, to the extent that the ACS needs analysis indicates that ACS would like to retain this property for a longer term, per city processes, DCAS, and ACS, ACS will be required to reevaluate the property in a much more thorough uh, inspection manner. And uh, they may develop then a longer term scope of work, if you will, that would correlate to a longer term lease. Any questions? <laughs> well timed, Ms. Lassison. Um, uh, just, I have two questions. One, um, and this may be more appropriate for ACS, is do you have any sense of when the needs assessment is going to be done? I do not. We are waiting on that from ACS as well, and uh, our colleagues from ACS are here to respond. Okay, thank you. And the second question is, um, appreciate what you said about the narrow scope of work for the five-year lease term. Um, could you submit that? or? And, and what does that entail? Absolutely, actually? yeah. So in general, and uh, I did receive it last night, um, and I will certainly submit it, yes. Um, so in general, uh, as I mentioned, general repair and maintenance matters that come up in the uh, course of, of, um, of occupancy and building operations. So things like um, some damaged <laughs> cove base, um, some exterior building painting, some caulking and some painting, um, the installation of additional smoke alarms, um, some plumbing issues need to be taken care of, lubrication of some windows, um, uh, some door closures needed to be modified, um, made a little smoother. So not a lot of material things. Again, the property has been in, uh, maintained in good condition. And as you heard yesterday at the review session, um, the roof has been looked after and some uh, repairs and some replacements in the roof have been done in recent years. Thank you. Any, any other questions? Ms. Efron. Um, in the Borough President's report, he references another daycare center that um, lost its lease, essentially. Um, uh, are you aware of any others that are in jeopardy currently that aren't uh, in the process of being renewed? Uh, I'm not aware of ones that are in jeopardy per se. ACS has several locations where the leases have expired. Um, they are operating on month-to-month -month, um, agreements with the landlords uh, and or under license agreements that and uh, pending Euler to execute long to execute leases. So there are a few out there. Are they in jeopardy? I would offer that every month-to-month -month situation may be in jeopardy at some point. But for the most part, the buildings are all daycare centers. They're schools. The owners are intending to continue to allow them to be operated to be operated for school. So I would say. Uh, um, Barring something adverse between the parties, uh, the likelihood of losing properties um, isn't very high. It just would depend upon any adversity between the parties. Thank you. Any other questions for Ms. Lazarson? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, next speaker is Connie Cho from ACS. Welcome, Ms. Cho. Hello. Good morning, uh, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners. Um, uh, my name is Connie Cho, and I am the Special Projects Manager for the Division of Early Care and Education. I work very closely with Allison Grant, who is the Chief of Staff, who has spoken here many times before. And I work with her on major initiatives, including the effort to ensure that there are daycare centers in areas with continuing community need. So in that vein, I am here today to let you know <laughs> that ACS is in favor of the continued use of this space at 20 Sutter Avenue um, as a daycare center, as the space is um, appropriately designed specifically for childcare services, and as indicated by preliminary analyses, um, there is a continued need for services in this area. Currently at 20 Sutter Avenue, uh, the contracted program providing early learn center-based care um, is the Friends of Crown Heights. Um, it's a well-established early learn contract <coughs> with over a dozen programs in multiple boroughs. Um, we've occupied this space since 1972, and the space is in good condition. Um, the Friends of Crown Heights uh, runs a child care program, meaning funded by the Child Care Block Grant, uh, serving families who are at or below 20% of the federal, 200, sorry, percent of the federal poverty line and have a reason for care. Um, it's contracted for 74 preschool seats and has an enrollment rate as of last week of 91%. Um, that's 67 preschoolers. Uh, preschoolers in the site, uh, four-year-olds are considered a part of the Pre-K for All initiative. Um, so there's a high utilization rate here and with just enough room for uh, new families to enroll. Um, I'm happy to answer qu any questions that you have to the best of my ability. Thank you. Uh, I'll ask the same question to you I asked to Ms. Lazison. Do you have any sense of when the needs assessment will be? 
completed? We um, are, you know, there is some refinement and it's being reviewed by our oversights and we are as eager as you are to share the information and continue to collaborate with the necessary partners like DCAS uh, and the commission. Thank you. Um, any questions for Ms. Cho? Thank you, Ms. Cho. Thank you. Yeah. Um, we also have others here from ACS facilities who are available to answer questions, but do any commissioners have questions? I don't believe so. Are you? Good morning. Uh, my name is Kudus Sheikh. I'm from ACS facilities. I'm here to answer any questions related to the physical building itself. There are no questions. I don't believe there are any questions. Okay. So thank you. You are relieved, <laughs> and we are relieved. Um, uh, and uh, if there's uh, anyone else who wishes to speak on this matter, not the hearing is closed. Thank you. Borough of Brooklyn, calendar numbers two and three, calendar number two, CD fifteen, N one five zero three four two Z R K. Calendar number three, C150343 ZSK, a public hearing in the matter of applications for an amendment of the zoning resolution and for the grant of a special permit concerning 3133-3135 Emmons Avenue. First speaker is Eric Plotnick. Welcome, Mr. Plotnick. Hello, welcome. Thank you for welcoming me. Uh, hello to the commission, and thank you for your time this morning. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today on part of an application that we've worked quite hard on for the past few years uh, with the Sheepshead Bay community. And what we are requesting is the opportunity for a text amendment to allow for the enlargement of an existing one and a half story. Uh, it's a use group six home health care service where the uh, home health care aides come and use it as their home base and have training and so forth and so on and then go out upon their days to go uh, tend to people in their homes. Uh, it's within an, the special Sheepshead Bay sub-district, which, uh, of course, your commission is quite familiar with. It's depicted right here. It's in sub-area G. Uh, for those who know the different sub-districts, it gets kind of confusing as you get through that, that regulate that language there. Uh, but within that district, it's an R5 C22 district. You're only allowed to have a commercial use of a 1.0 floor area ratio. The applicant here has been a very successful business. They've been there for many years. They're in, they lease the space for a 50-year lease that's set to expire in the year 2062, and they have intentions of staying there through the duration of the lease. But in order to accommodate their business, which is located primarily within the area, the clientele that they service, they would like to enlarge the building. In order to do that, they'd be exceeding the allowable floor area ratio, and they'd be bringing it up to a 2.0 floor area ratio, or a total floor area of 23,348 square feet. Right now, the building has 12,297 square feet, which is a 1.0 floor area ratio. So they're asking permission to essentially double the floor area ratio. And when they do that, they're required to have 78 parking spaces. The problem is we can't fit 78 parking spaces in the parking garage that's in the building right now. And we're asking to reduce that number to 32 parking spaces. We believe the request is a proper request because the parking spaces are really quite underutilized. Uh, most of the people coming there, as I mentioned, are home health care aides. Uh, most everybody either gets dropped off or they take mass transit. There are three bus stops right out front, and then they go out to their day in, in a similar way where they go out and use mass transit to get out to the clientele. So the parking lot right now has been empty or primarily empty for a very long period of time. There's about six or seven cars that are in there daily. So we're asking permission to enlarge the building. Uh, when we do that, we'll be adding to the building. Right now, the building is uh, one. I, that's showing the proposed rendering. But right now, it's a one and a half story building. It's a full build out at the first floor. And the second floor has a setback and has a mezzanine level. We're asking to fill in that mezzanine level, which is right now 2,469 square feet. And when completed, that mezzanine level will be built lot line to lot line. And it'll be 10,190 square feet. And then we're asking to build on top of that a small enlargement of 3,307 square feet. So we're essentially taking the, the one-story and setback building that exists right now and making it a two-story and setback building. The problem is when we do that, it's the floor area that I spoke about, it's the parking that I spoke about, and it's also within the sub-district. You're not required to have a commercial use above the second floor, and you're not allowed to have more than three, more than two stories of commercial use. And if I may finish. It's acceptable? Finish the sentence. Finish the sentence. What we're asking for is the ability to go to a maximum height of 35 feet, and it'll be three stories. 
Thank you. That's our application. Uh, questions for Mr. Plotney? Thank you. No, 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 oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was going to ask how many parking spaces are, are there uh, proposed after the completion? 32 when it's done. Um, any other questions for Mr. Plotney? Uh, Ms. Delos. And how many are there currently? Right now, it gets a little bit tricky here. There are 44 currently. We're not changing the parking configuration. <laughs> The space can still accommodate 44 spaces. That's what's on the CFO. But when we made this application, your technical review division, which is quite skilled, Mr. Ramnarian, uh, pointed out that the parking, the requirements of the size of a parking lot, a parking spot have changed since the building was CFO'd. So although it's 44 on the CFO and you could actually fit 44 in there, the way that Department of Buildings counts how big a space is has increased in size for the actual parking space. So although the physical overall space in the parking lot has not changed at all, the parking count has changed from 44 to 32 because under the new calculations, you can only fit 32. And, and, sure. I, and I understand that the community board, I think, asked for some follow-up uh, analysis related to the parking. Is that is that true? That is true. And we went to the community board twice. We had a follow-up meeting with Mr. Hiram Rothkrug was there. He's here with me today, too. He's with Environmental Project Data Statements Company. And he prepared an on-street parking analysis as well as a survey of people that come to and from the property. And he found that there was adequate on-street parking availability, and he confirmed the fact that not too many people come by car. And that, that was uh, two times we were at the community board talking about that. Thank you. Any other questions for Mr. Plotnick? Mr. Cantor. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Cantor. What's the striping going to be based upon? The striping? Yeah. In, in the parking lot? Yeah. It's going to be based upon the current regulations. Uh, it's, I believe it's 15. I have to take a look at the plan, but it's 15 by, I forget the exact size of what it is. But. So it's a lesser count. It's a lesser count due to the, the, the dimensions that are utilized now as compared to when we see a vote. Is Billy Palmer taking the position that if you wanted to describe it at the, at the uh, smaller tighter, size? Tighter spacing, do you believe the department is that a violation? Yes, I believe they would, according to our discussions with your technical review division. That's why we changed the numbers. Any other questions, Ms. Plotting? Thank you. Thank you for your time. Uh, the next speaker is uh, Hiram, Hiram uh, Rothkrieg. <coughs> Mr. Roth, if there are no questions for him, he doesn't need to speak, but he's happy to speak if you have any questions. Any one have questions for Mr. Rothkrieg? Hearing none. Um, is there anyone else who wishes to speak on this matter? Um, hearing none, the hearing is closed. <coughs> A very efficient hearing for Chief's head back. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Borough of Brooklyn, calendar number four, CD3, N160134, HKK. A public hearing in the matter of a communication regarding the landmark designation of the Bedford Historic District. <clears throat> um, the first speaker is, is it Claude uh, Brady? Claudette. Claudette Brady. How do you do? I'm fine, thank you. Good morning. My name is Claudette Brady. I am one of the founders of the Bedford Stuyvesant Historic <coughs> Society for Historic Preservation. Um, in 2007, we started with um, trying to gain landmark status for the Bedford Historic District. Between 2007 and 2010, we had over 30 community meetings with the members of the Bedford Historic District. Before our first meeting, we did a mailing because we wanted to have absolute transparency as to the process. We had met with the individual block associations and then decided to have a larger uh, meeting at the, um, the boys' high school um, in, Bed in Bedford-Stuyvesant. Our second meeting, again, we did a mailing by, by post, a postal mailing for the district. Both of those meetings, we had um, over, two, uh, two, over 150 people attended, 150 residents attended. After those meetings, we had individual meetings with block associations, some of those meetings having up to 60 residents per meeting. We also went door to door within this district. We distributed information to every single homeowner in the district regarding the process for historic des designation. And we also had a petition signed by the, the members of the district. When we did the petition, we actually, um, dis um, we actually set up the, the petition so that we could designate which, homeowner, which buildings were homeowner occupied and which buildings were not. <coughs> Of the buildings that were homeowner occupied, we had a 95% favorable rate for historic de designation. Um, when we had the 
designation hearing at LPC, there were um, 38 people um, uh, testifying that day. Four people were opposed to the districts. Of that four, three were non-members of the district. I've heard that they've been called into question the fact that 220 letters were sent to LPC regarding saying that, stating that they needed more information on the designation process. However, LPC has found that only 34 of those letters for, were from members of the district. The, the collection of those letters were done by um, outside people from with, outside the district who prior to um, collecting those signatures also placed anti-landmarking flyers throughout the district with information such as landmarking will raise your taxes, which is completely um, unfounded by all surveys um, about um, landmarking districts. Um, so I'm just here to state that through my um, seven years of doing this and walking the blocks and knowing most of these residents, that the bulk of the residents in the Bedford Historic District are in favor of the designation. Thank you, Ms. Brady. Questions? Uh, Ms. Delos. I, I just want to thank you for your work. Um, and that, that grassroots work is very critical. I'm just wondering, um, considering the delay of when all of that happened and the fact that we're here today at this time, um, uh, what kind of uh, communication, besides assuming this goes forward and everything's fine, what kind of communication do you think would be most helpful um, to have people understand what's currently going we, on? We've had communications, um, smaller meetings um, over, the, over the time. The last major meeting we had was in 2010. Uh, we've had meetings at the block association level. Community Board 3 has had some meetings, some general meetings on landmark designation for um, the broader, because um, we have actually five proposed districts um, for the broader, broader community. And um, there is a newsletter that I do often, um, which updates people on what the progress is. And, 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 and again, re reaffirming or reiterating what the process or what it will be like when they become designated. Thank you. Mr. Eady. Mr. Eady. Thank you. Um, any understanding as to why people from outside the district would be trying to influence this action at this time? Real estate. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the value of real estate in Bedford-Stuyvesant. Mm -hmm. OK. Um, um, ex can you expound upon that? I don't OK, so, so basically, the, the, the outside people were the Real Estate Board of New York. All right, Katie Schwab came in and had a meeting with the ministers of several ministers in Bedford Stuyvesant to discuss why, why landmarking would be bad for the district. Okay. Thank you. And if we look at, I mean, if I can expound further, I mean, our the during the um, the last um, 36 district councilmatic um, election, uh, the opponent who lost by 68 votes was funded pretty much by Jobs for New York. His campaign manager was also involved in, 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 in the anti-landmark movement, and she was at, at the time or previously a lobbyist for the Real Estate Board of New York. Got it. Thank you. OK. <laughs> and you can check the campaign finance document, <laughs> which I do. As you you <laughs> say that you say that with a degree of confidence. Oh, 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 yeah. <laughs> Only those people who also read legislation. <laughs> Ms. Levin. <laughs> Yes, so I, I also just want to compliment you on your diligence and your passion for this. And it looks like there's some real gems in this historic district, um, as well as you know an intact whole that is um, really nice to see preserved. I guess I'm curious to know, um, does your organization or your efforts um, extend to other historic districts? Are you working on um, other things to come? So basically, we had, um, I guess, 2008 or so, uh, the community board had put in for, um, we had put in for the designation of, um, of the Bedford Historic District, at least the first part, and then community board three had put in for the designation of the second part, which we were calling phase one and phase two at the time. And um, so we combined efforts on Bedford, and in, there was also Stuyvesant North, um, another proposed district, Stuyvesant East and Stuyvesant <coughs> and Stuyvesant West, and also, which has been designated for the Stuyvesant High Crescent. <coughs> there are actually now three more proposed districts sitting on the table. 
the city, okay. And um, you mentioned the community board, at least in our briefing materials, we didn't see any indication of their position on this. Are they in support of this? They are in support of it, and, I, I, and they testified in favor at the- uh, At LPC? At the LPC hearing. Okay. Good, well, thank you. A any other questions for Ms. Brady? Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, is there anyone else who wishes to be heard on this matter? Mm -hmm. If not, the hearing is closed. Thank you. Bar of Brooklyn, calendar number 5, CD2, N160127, PXK, a public hearing in the matter of a notice of intent to acquire office space for use of property located at 1 Paramount Plaza Law Department. <laughs> Paramount, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, welcome back, Ms. Lazarson. <laughs> I think it's going to be, uh, you know, do, could run the table here, Ms. Lazerson. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. Okay, so, uh, yes, again, I'm Dale Lazerson. Thank you. Um, I am here to support the application for the uh, acquiring office space. This is for the Family Court Division of the Law Department. They are currently located at uh, 330 and 350 J Street. And due to um, uh, some new legislation forthcoming, I expect some significant growth, and the current spaces that they occupy cannot, cannot accommodate the growth. So uh, we are proposing to take approximately 40,000 square feet of space in one Pierpont Plaza, um, which is a 19-story office building of about 600,000 square feet. Uh, the city does have some space in this building, um, other entities of the city, uh, the appellate court, I believe. Um, the offices, uh, the proposed term will be long term, about 20 years with some renewal options, a right to cancel as well. Um, this will be for the general office and administrative use by the attorneys and staff um, for the family court uh, division. <coughs> there won't be that many visitors uh, to this particular space. Most of the visiting functions will still um, take place at the J Street locations, but there will be some interaction. Um, uh, for some uh, disposition interviews, et cetera, with respect to the caseload. Um, I'm here to answer any questions. Uh, questions, for Ms. Lazarson. Uh, Ms. Efron. The community board mentioned a court officer outside. Um, could you let us know the status of that? Yeah, so I believe that the mention was in um, consideration of parking concerns, double parking concerns, perhaps. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think they were listed as two separate concerns. There was a double parking concern, but I'm not sure that the court officer was specifically around the double parking. Oh, okay. Uh, I'm sorry. So I, I, I thought that it was. If it was sorry, about I, I, I could very okay. easily be wrong. I know they okay. were in the same sentence, but I mis sure. maybe misread if, it as being part of the same thing. If the court officer was uh, related to more operations and the comings and goings and the perhaps actual operational functions, I believe that a representative from the law department is here today to speak. Well, it's great. Toward operations and any concerns <coughs> in that regard. But again, most of the interface um, uh, takes place at the J Street. With respect to the double parking, so it's a, it's a fair concern, but I think um, uh, by the nature of these operations, minimized. Um, again, because most of the visitors are going to be coming and going from J Street. Also, um, the area you know has parking garages, et cetera. But something um, as well, the particular owner of this building, Ratner, is a very large uh, owner of real estate and is not a fan of heavy traffic in this building that would actually cause that kind of street disruption. So I know that there has been a lot of dialogue about that. And again, the law department with the owner and DCAS feel that the likelihood for double parking, other than maybe some kind of negligent behavior, is pretty minimized here. Um, Ms. Lazarson, at, at the review session yesterday, I think Ms. Della Ouz raised the question of that the legislation that triggers this is pending, and uh, it, I assume this lease is contingent on that legislation being enacted, although it seems like that is going to happen. Is that So the lease itself does not have the contingency. The lease is not executed yet. And the reason that we are before you is a matter of city processes and timelines. Um, the space, uh, yesterday there was some comments made about the space and its improvements. The space improve, there will be some improvements needed to the space which can take some time. Getting through the legal documents up to a point of execution will take some time. So we have all the general terms understood and negotiated, proposed, 
but we uh, are um, the timeline for us to complete all the documentation and then build out, et cetera, if you will, should correlate nicely to the passing of the legislation. It, it, it also goes really to the acquisition of space in the market, our ability to be timely to procure space to meet these kind of needs. And that legislation is pending where? State. At the state, I think. I, I believe it's at the state, but again, a representative from the law department is here and can speak more, in more detail about that matter. Okay. Any other questions for Ms. Lazarson? Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Um, next speaker from the law department, uh, Ken Majors. I'm Ken Majors. I'm sorry. Ken Majoris, I'm the Deputy Chief of Administration. Um, I'm obviously for this. So <laughs> I guess it's just if there's any questions that you have. Ms. Dellows. So what is the anticipated timeline on the legislation? Um, <laughs> completely unknown. We, we really do not know, except that the uh, uh, <clears throat> original legislation said 2017. January 2017, which leaves us no time, unless mm -hmm. if we start acting now. Mm -hmm. And in the event that the decision is delayed um, indefinitely, um, what what use? What, how would this be put to use? The the <coughs> space itself, uh, given my experience, would be a year and a half away before we could occupy. Maybe two years before we could occupy. Um, our belief is that this will happen within that time. This actually, I probably should have asked this of Ms. Lazarson. So I guess the question then is, in the event it doesn't happen or it gets delayed indefinitely, which seems unlikely, um, what provision in the lease is there to sublet? You may not know that. Um, or to uh, break the lease. But I guess that could be something that's follow shared <coughs> as a follow-up item. Our experience is that the city is always looking for space. <laughs> no, I, I hear that. Yeah. There will be another program to move in, I'm pretty certain. <laughs> Mr. Knuckles. Uh, this question may be uh, better put to Ms. Lazarson as well, but uh, you have it. it. Uh, two years. Why, why would it take uh, two years to ultimately <laughs> occupy the space? All that we have at the moment is a test fit. So uh, we don't have fully built floor plans. We don't have electrical, plumbing, all of those things that have to be designed yet by an architectural firm. Right. And then um, reviewed, <coughs> it takes about six months. Uh, and then you have to negotiate, you have to, to do the bids to get a general contractor, subcontractors and all of that kind of thing. So we're currently doing a space up at 1775 and this is about the same timeline. It's almost two years. A longer process than we would like, but. And what's, and as I understand it, this is, it has to be the space here and the role of the law department is closely coordinated with um, uh, court activities, at, um, I guess in the Supreme Court building. Um, so, and since clients are not going to be here, principally, um, what I don't quite understand the need for the five spaces. For the? Five parking spaces. Um, well, what we have is that uh, the police sometimes come in and park. And again, we don't want them on the streets, so they have that space. Uh, we have our operations division, which delivers files between the various offices. Uh, we now have five offices. So they have to deliver files back and forth. Uh, and our administration people, facilities, the drivers have to bring in supplies, paper, take out boxes for archiving, which won't be a real concern in that place for another few years. But it's, it's those kind of administrative issues that, <clears throat> excuse me, that we have. And that requires five spaces in, a, in an area where parking That's been is our at a real in our premium? Others. That's been our experience in our other places. Now, whether or not we get those five spaces, I don't have any idea at, at the moment. That's being negotiated. And that's negotiated with, with whom? With Through DOT? DCAS. DCAS will negotiate that with the landlord. With the landlord or with DOT? Uh, no, with, them, with the landlord, because we're not asking for on-street spaces. Yeah. Ah, this will be okay. in the garage. In the garage, OK. Yes, yes. OK. 
Um, thank you. Any other questions for Mr. Majors? Hearing none. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Is there anyone else who wishes to be heard on this matter? If not, the hearing is closed. Thank you. Borough of Manhattan, calendar number 6, CD1, N160118, PXM. A public hearing in the matter of a notice of intent to acquire office space for use of property located at 375 Pearl Street. Hello, good morning. All right. <laughs> you again. <laughs> How are you, Ms. Lazarson? I hope I don't disappoint, and I may be uh, cashing in on my frequent flyer miles that you offered last year. Great. So 375 Pearl, um, before I start, I, I would like to offer um, some, uh, some terrific visuals for you. Um, mm -hmm. The building that you know, I actually don't have the picture of it today, you know the building that we're talking about, 375 Pearl, is this, um, to quote, Commissioner Cantor, perhaps in a few years it would be considered um, modern architecture. <laughs> it's not the, the prettiest. A landmark. Landmark, perhaps. Um, architecturally, I will say, you know, with the original use of the building being uh, for Verizon and data center, it served its purpose. Today, however, and uh, I just uh, acquired this, I will certainly be happy to pass it around. Ta da! <laughs> um, this has hit the papers, 375pearl.com. The building will have new windows punched through it. Yeah. So this is marketing material, et cetera. So during my last presentation, um, I spoke about the NYPD um, proposing to lease some office space in the tower, and I mentioned to Commissioner Efron uh, that the existing ribbons you see actually are windows, not great. Well, some of that is changing on the upper floors, and we hope that you're delighted. Community Board 1 certainly is delighted. You certainly right. made Mr. Cantor's day, I'm yes. sure. <laughs> yes. These are only renderings only. We can't hold anybody to it, but we're excited. That said, uh, I am here to support uh, a joint application, DCAS and the Department of Finance, and representatives from the Department of Finance are here to speak with you today. Um, as uh, you mentioned yesterday, this hopefully is the last piece in a puzzle of moving spaces. Uh, the Department of Finance will be taking um, approximately 175,000 square feet of space, floors 26 through 30 as proposed, this particular tower, to accommodate uh, staff currently located at 210 Jerolamon and 345 Adams. Um, there's a reshuffle and restack going on in Brooklyn at these particular city-owned properties to accommodate for the courts. Um, the proposed transaction uh, will accommodate 650 uh, plus or minus employees. The spaces will be built out to <coughs> professional office standards for DOF. Um, uh, the particular lease will be 20 years plus some renewal options, nice long-term lease. Um, any questions I can answer for you? I think we've had some dialogue. Any, any questions from Ms. Lassus? <laughs> Mr. Knuckles. What percentage of uh, the tenants, uh, tenancy in the building now is uh, city agencies? Do you know that? So that's a great question, thanks. And let me um, uh, clarify something mentioned <coughs> yesterday. Um, I believe that there was a statement made that the um, NYPD is currently occupying the building. Their construction actually hasn't started yet, so we, we received the, the 195 approval from you, and that transaction is moving forward a little more slowly than we'd like. So proposed, therefore, uh, for the building will be the NYPD that you heard before, their risk management um, um, group, federal monitoring group, um, DOF. And we are also looking at it with some other agencies. In terms of percentage, <laughs> once signed, sealed, and delivered, uh, from the office space, the building is just under a million square feet, about 800, give or take. I suspect that we will be somewhere in this 70% range, give or take, if everything comes to fruition. So my next question obviously follows. Is this a, a possible acquisition uh, uh, target for the city? That's a great question. Not at this time. The property, um, in repositioning itself, the property is a condominium property. There are two condominium owners. One is Verizon. So um, I believe I may have mentioned this at a prior hearing, but I'll mention it again. The lower portion of the tower is for data center. The tower was always for data center, of course, but they are maintaining the data center, ter tremendous infrastructure for that. 
Then the upper rise, 23 up, is for commercial office space and creative and innovative space. The, as Verizon is the condominium owner of some of the lower portions, um, uh, SABI is the operating uh, partner and owner of the rest of the building. I'm sorry, who is that? Uh, SABI. CBRE. No, 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 no. CBRE is, the, uh, is a property manager and leasing agent, SABI, S-A-B-E-Y. Uh, they are very, very well known in the Northwest, uh, um, yeah, Pacific Northwest. Um, they operate a lot of uh, technical space, own and operate a lot of technical space. So they were a terrific match here to pick up this property to help operate the data center. Um, but as a new condominium owner, per se, of several years, I don't believe that they will be selling anything in the near-term future. Yeah. Hmm. I, I might also mention, though, um, in repositioning this building, because I think it's great for, for uh, Lower Manhattan now, on floor 14, Sabi is marketing the floor for um, uh, the building as conference <coughs> space, uh, just an amenity for the tenants in the building. So, As what kind of space? I'm sorry. Um, like conference room space, conference room conferencing, space. et cetera. So they really are treating the building now, not, not only for the individual tenant spaces, but also to accommodate some service needs. Amenities. Uh, are those the renderings that you've, uh, the renderings are of the common space, or the <coughs> renderings are of the... DOF space so that you're I just believe, submitting? Yeah, so I believe what, this is a marketing package. I believe what I've given you is of tenant space on the window line, there's two shell floors there you saw. Then there's the lobby area. And then those are um, <laughs> Savy's idea of what some creative space might be built out for tenants, but not necessarily <coughs> specific. Yeah. And I also can't rec... rec um, I can't represent that Starbucks is actually signed up yet, although it's in their marketing material, so we're thinking it might be. Which will make DOF very happy. So, um, any other questions to Ms. Robinson? Thank you, Ms. Oh, Mr. Mr. Marin. We, we didn't actually get a, a, a clear answer. So the windows being installed are for the purposes of the tenants, and one of the tenants that are being proposed is the police department. Is that correct? Uh, yes, that's correct, actually. So the upper floors, um, I believe uh, floors 19, I don't believe it goes as low as 18. I believe 19 up to uh, the penthouse level is 31. Up to 31 will now have this glass facade. The um, NYPD is proposed for the 20th floor, I believe. Yeah, so everybody above will be getting some nice uh, Larger views. Larger <laughs> Thank you. Um, thank you. Any other questions? Thank you, Ms. Lasherson. Next speaker is uh, James Lawler from HRA. James Lawler from HRA. What's that? So this is six. This is wrong number. Oh, sorry. Pardon me. Um, next That's a speaker. different James. Jacqueline James. Yes. Sorry. Hi, my name is Jacqueline James. I apologize for the mix-up. That's okay. Jacqueline James, Chief Financial Officer and Deputy Commissioner for the Department of Finance Administration and Finance. Do you have any questions for us? <laughs> <laughs> any questions? Any questions? Hearing none so far. None. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and uh, Sheila Williams from um, Department of Finance. No? Hearing none. Okay. Um, is there anyone who actually wishes to speak on this matter uh, other than Ms. Lavison? Um, and hearing none, the hearing is closed. Thank you very much. Okay. Borough of Manhattan, calendar number 7, CD1, N160119, PXM, a public hearing in the matter of a notice of intent to acquire office space for use of property located at 123 William Street. Welcome back. Hello. Hi. Hi. <laughs> it's all happening in Lower Manhattan this morning. Okay. So this particular application in front of you is for, oh, thank you so much. This particular application in front of you is for the Department of Youth and Community Development, and representatives are here to speak, um, to answer questions about the operations. Um, 
The subject property is 123 Williams, and the proposal on the table is for uh, the city to acquire under a lease approximately 40,000 square feet of office space located on floors 17 and 18 of the building for use by DYCD. General administrative back office functions, um, including some executive functions. Uh, the commissioner's <coughs> office is located here, public affairs, um, executive staff, finance, budget, uh, fiscal, public affairs, etc. Uh, the building um, is a, uh, I believe it's a 19-story, 26-story building, yeah, um, of approximately 490,000 square feet. So for reference, that's about half the size of 375 Pearl that we just spoke about. Um, I should qualify that DYCD is currently in occupancy. They are in possession and occupancy of both floors. Um, and uh, again, um, representatives from DYCD will speak a little more toward this today, following me, but... In 2012, uh, DYCD was located at 156 Williams and 161 Williams Street, um, as well as 2 Lafayette. There was um, a good push to try and locate uh, city agencies into owned property. 2 Lafayette is an owned property building. As the 156 Williams Street lease was expiring in 2012, uh, that was the goal. However, um, with growth at the time. Further catapulted in 2014 with mayoral initiatives and funding uh, for some additional programs, including Compass for DYCD. To Lafayette, a consolidation was not going to accommodate all of the, all of the staff and personnel. So um, while 150 Sun, 156 Williams went away under natural exploration, 161 William where they currently occupy remains, and additional space is needed. That is 123. So in 2014, the city was charged, DCAS was charged with assisting DYCD in very quickly acquiring space. The particular space found um, right adjacent to their other operations, so perfectly well located, was actually built <coughs> out by a former tenant. So it was readily available to occupy with some very minor alterations, except for a section of the 18th floor. Uh, so the city, using a vehicle available to it, a license agreement, was able to take possession of the space and DYCD moved in. As the, uh, with the passage of time, um, we are now looking to secure the space under a long-term um, opportunity for DYCD. And I will mention that, again, the space is built out with the exception of a portion of the 18th floor. When DYCD took occupancy, the prior tenant had a portion that was kind of um, open, and they were uh, high tech, et cetera. And that will be improved for um, the office use intended. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you. OK, thank you. Um, next speaker, I guess, to answer questions only, uh, John Sorolia from uh, DYCD. Excuse me. Good morning. My name is John Sorolia. I am Deputy Commissioner for Administration and Department of Youth and Community Development. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Any questions for Mr. Sorolia? Hearing none. Thank you. Congratulations, <laughs> Mr. Sorolia. Um, is there anyone else who wishes to be heard on this matter? Hearing none, the hearing is closed. Borough of the Bronx, calendar number 8, CD 10, N160131, PXX. A public hearing in the matter of a notice of intent to acquire office space for use of property located at 2500 Hasley Street. Holly Street. Good morning. My name is Jim Lawler. Uh, I'm with the uh, facilities group of HRA. I've been asked to speak briefly about the functions that we'd like to move to uh, this location. Uh, two medical uh, service provide groups of HRA moving from 260 11th Avenue in Midtown Manhattan. Both are back office functions. The first is a application renewal unit. Apparently each year, uh, Medicaid recipients must renew their applications, so they uh, submit those mostly electronically. It's a back office function. They're submitted and processed and responded to electronically. The second group that's moving there is a helpline. 
where uh, clients and prospective clients can call in and ask questions and inquire about services. Again, it's a back office function. Coincidentally, the space that we're moving into is fully furnished. It is formerly occupied by Affinity Healthcare, and what Affinity Healthcare did there was exactly what we're going to do there. They process applications and receive phone calls. Questions? Ms. Efron. <laughs> All right, could you um, just give us a breakdown of the call center square footage versus the rest of the space? Okay, so the call center would occupy about 101 desks, and that would be 13,231 square feet. Okay. Um, I, I just want to make the point, um, it, it's great that there are so many people employed. There are 481 in staff. Um, in what should be um, an industrial space with high concentration of employees because it is an IBZ. Um, will there be any outreach to the surrounding neighborhood for employment opportunities going forward? I don't know if that's exactly your um, area of expertise at HRA, but uh, given that HRA is in the business of improving people's lives in many different ways, including through uh, employment activities, it would be great to know, given that it is a fairly large employer in that neighborhood, if it would have any interaction with the neighborhood. Well, it is not my area of expertise, but uh, from what I understand from the program people, they would like to attract people from that neighborhood, from the Bronx, uh, and uh, if they can't reassign their own staff, they do flyer for positions, and they do like to attract people whose commutes and everything would not be as uh, difficult as it would be to get into Manhattan. So they would be looking for people from the Bronx. I can follow up. Um, given that there are some excellent one stops um, and other service providers under city contracts in the Bronx, it would be great if there actually was coordination um, from there. It's obviously not within our purview to uh, require that, but uh, it just seems like a great opportunity. I'll mention that back. Um, any other questions for Mr. Lawler? Mr. Knuckles. Uh, Mr. Lawler, I just want to confirm that the uh, that map. Uh, currently at 260 11th Avenue is not uh, a, a service that uh, directly engages clients. This is all by mail uh, or online. Is that correct? It's it's mail, online, and telephone. Yes, sir. No clients. No clients. All right. Thank you. Any other questions for Mr. Lawler? Thank you, Mr. Lawler. Thank you. And? Last but not least, <laughs> star of the day, Ms. Lazarson, well, welcome back. I'll take that. Ta-da! <laughs> I'm sorry, uh, this was an 11th hour introduction, but given that you were all about land planning and use, I thought you might appreciate a quick little picture of the building. Um, so uh, this application, as Jim stated, is for HRA's uh, back office use per se. It's a relocation uh, from some other facilities um, that are situated for uh, this particular economic climate um, or I guess area um, the overall building is uh, probably about 150,000 square feet give or take the HRA particular uh, space is about 74,000 square feet um, it will have a separate entrance um, so it is a multi tenant building but HRA will have a separate entrance um, other tenants in the building are also um, office administrative, including UFT, United Federation of Teachers. Um, is the rest of the building fully occupied? Uh, I know that United Federation of Teachers is there. I think that there may be one available other space um, of about 40,000 square feet. So I don't believe it's fully occupied. It's, uh, I think the <coughs> landlord has some availability. Yeah. Um, and the proposal on the table, uh, it is for uh, an office lease, however, starting in 2019. Up until that point, uh, the proposal is a sublease. The current tenant uh, mentioned yesterday and again this morning is Affinity Insurance. They have uh, um, designs to vacate the space. The furniture will be left behind. The city will be able to leverage that um, for its operations. So the sublease will run through. Uh, the expiration of Finney's lease, August of 2019, and then a direct lease will be in place with the city. And again, I'll, uh, let me qualify, not again, but let me qualify. This is not an assignment. It actually is a sublease. Mm -hmm. So there will be, um, we are a second subordinate seat. There will be one party between the city and the overlord. 
Ms. Zephron. It looks like a great office building, um, but it does give me the opportunity to ask a question, and, and also a, a really good reuse of space that I hope will be economical for the city. Um, when uh, your office is considering a lease, is there any coordination with EDC or SBS around IBZs, or is it just property by property? In other words, is there any consideration for putting in an office space or an office tenant in what's uh, considered an industrial business zone specifically for the improvement of economic development opportunities of a particular neighborhood and for manufacturing? So I think, um, it's a two-part question, when we have an agency that has a need in a specific geographic area, uh, as we search that area and we identify where potential opportunities fall within what zones, if it is an economic development zone, if there are any kind of um, uh, agencies, redevelopment plans, et cetera, we are certainly in a position to outreach to discuss that. I don't believe uh, that at this point in time, we're necessarily reaching out to those agencies first to say, hey, what do you have available that we may be able to come into? I actually mean the opposite, <laughs> which is um, there's, at least on my part, a real concern that IBZ's purposes are specifically for manufacturing and economic development. And we are seeing more leases in I, uh, for city agencies in IBZs or in other um, longstanding manufacturing parks, such as um, College Point Industrial Park. Uh, so I'm just wondering if there is any coordination to um, keep or policy or any sharing of information uh, or a starring of properties when they do appear in city-run or city oversight areas for economic development. I don't know that there is a policy on that. I can certainly find out and get back to you on that. I, I think at this point in time, my experience is it's on a property-by-property Search by search-by-search search basis that this dialogue takes place, but I can I can certainly find out if we have a policy on that from a site searching perspective and reach. Yeah, and, and just to follow up on Ms. Efron's question, <coughs> that in, that certain um, industrial and corporate parks are managed by curated by EDC, such as College Point, and the IBZs for the most part uh, do have city-funded um, organizations that are charged with the responsibility to encourage and maintain and enhance the areas as for manufacturing whenever possible. And it does seem to me that since that is city policy to, particularly in the IBZs, to um, maintain and and um, strengthen them as industrial areas that for DCAS should be reaching out to not only to EDC but to the organizations that are funded by the city uh, to assure that whatever uses are compatible with the goals of that area. Mm -hmm. Certainly, yes. Yes, well, I will get back to you as whether or not any policy exists, but I, just from my own experience with some of my own projects, I know that the dialogue does take place. It is taking place just to make sure that the intended use is cohesive with the overall area's plan. Um, for this particular transaction, I don't know that there was dialogue that took place. I can certainly get back to you on that. And I will bring back to DCAS your thoughts on this matter. Yeah, I mean, it's really I'm just knowing, obviously, you have a responsibility and mission here to find space for city agencies, but, and, and are dealing probably for the most part, especially in these IBCs with private property owners. So your discussions, DCAS's discussions with private property owners are likely to be under the radar and not known to the uh, managers of those IBCs, unless you b bring it to their attention. But, yeah, and, and I think it, as a matter of city policy, it would be important that you do do that. Yes, that's a very good point. I will bring it back to our management to discuss this. Thank you. Ms. Levin. Um, just out of curiosity, I have a question about um, what's become of affinity and why they're moving out. But I, to, to the earlier discussion, this, I guess this is facilities that already has been outfitted for right. office space. So um, 
you know, mm -hmm. less problematic. I mean, this is an important policy discussion, <laughs> but less costly. right. I, I think in this instance, it, it seems clear this. And and actually, would you, to that point, would you, was this built to suit for affinity in the first place? I don't know. Okay. And your question uh, prompts a very good question for me. I I actually don't know the history of that. If it was, um, I, I don't. I don't know that it was. I know that the owner is relatively new that purchased the property, but I'll um, uh, I'll find out. Is that little card floating around? I need to get that back. <laughs> uh, it's right here on the end. <coughs> yeah. But I am also curious about you know just thinking about the kinds of business activities that are going on in the city. What what was it that has prompted Affinity? Is, is Affinity staying in the city? Um, have they been forced to leave the city? What does it say about? Um, employment patterns in the yeah. city and so I'll on. I'll go ahead and find out for you just what their intentions are, if they are in a position to disclose them. It may very well be that they're right-sizing, that they're just changing. Many businesses are evolving right. over time. But I'll, uh, if they're willing to disclose, I'll certainly follow up with you. Okay. But as far as you know, they're not going out of business. Not to my knowledge. Anybody else? No, we have the answer. Oh, <laughs> yes, thank you. <laughs> yes. Sure. Please. Affinity has actually outgrown the space mm -hmm. and moved to new, newer space about a mile away. I think they're doing very well mm -hmm. during the uh, past World Series. If you've shown uh, pictures of the scoreboard at City Field, the top most advertisement was Affinity. <laughs> <laughs> so are they remaining in, the, is there a mile away site in the city? Yes. Okay. <coughs> um, okay, any other questions for Ms. Lazarson? Mr. Knuckles. May I ask a, an unrelated question, Mr. Chairman? <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, what's going into the uh, ground floor of the La, uh, two Lafayette uh, that's being built out? Used to be retail space there, pizza, and et cetera. It's being built out. I'm just curious. What's going on? You know, uh, I, I actually don't know. Colleagues of mine oversee our own property portfolio, so uh, I'm not. Uh, Daily, I don't have a lens into that, but I can find out. I thought you. you knew everything. <laughs> <laughs> I like to say I know what I know and I know what I don't know. <laughs> Very honest about that. I can certainly find out for you. Great question. Okay. Good to have some interest. Thank you. Um, any other questions for Ms. Lazarson? Thank you, Ms. Lazarson. Thank you very much. Um, for a very smooth day today. <laughs> um, uh, is there anyone else who wishes to be heard on this matter? not, the hearing is closed. And Madam Secretary, is there any other <laughs> matters to be brought before us today? No Chairman Weisbrot. <laughs> I will <laughs> entertain a motion to adjourn. All in chorus. <laughs> I hear no dissenting views, and we are adjourned. Thank you very much.